existing, one million, two million, three million. <laughs> well, you can always hear that anyway. And, uh, uh, you know, I, when I came down today, it's been, it's been 50, uh, 54 years since I drove down uh, what was then the Highway 6, the Cornhusker Highway, to uh, come to Lincoln to school. And even then, there was a lot of nostalgia attached with it because my father had uh, uh, attended the University of Nebraska in the 1920s. Uh, he was editor of the Daily Nebraskan, and one day a, a young woman from West Point, a uh, student, came in to apply for a job as a reporter on the Daily Nebraskan, and, uh, and uh, my father not only hired her as a reporter, but he married her shortly thereafter. So both my parents attended here. My grandfather uh, on my mother's side was here in the, in the 1890s. And, uh, uh, so a lot of good things have happened to me because of the University of Nebraska. I, I received a terrific education here. Uh, I was telling the dean um, the most valuable thing I learned here, but I learned a lot, but the most valuable was, was uh, accounting, and we had a wonderful professor named Ray Dean. Uh, there may even be something named for him down here, isn't there? Yeah, I'd, I mean, uh, he was, uh, I'd been to the Wharton School, I went to Columbia Graduate School uh, subsequently, but, and I took a lot of accounting courses, but by far the best instruction I received in accounting came from Ray Dean, and, and uh, there's nothing more important. I, uh, people ask me what they should take in business school, and, 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 uh, uh, or even if they don't go to business school, what they need to know before getting in business, and I tell them, you know, you have to, you have to understand accounting. It's the language. I mean, it, it would be, it's like being in a foreign country without knowing the language if you're in business and you don't understand accounting. So it, 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 you, you want to get as comfortable with that uh, as you are with the English language. It, it, it's made me uh, uh, a lot of money because I, I listened to what Ray Dean had to say 53 or 4 years ago and have been able to understand uh, what I was seeing on pieces of paper, what that told me about businesses and the limitations of what it told me about businesses. I mean, I, but that's the way we invest. Uh, yesterday, I was in Knoxville, Tennessee, and we bought a company, we agreed to buy a company called Clayton Homes about a week ago. It's a big company in the manufactured home business. Uh, we agreed to pay $1.7 billion for it. I made that deal over the phone without ever meeting the people there, but I had seen enough through reading 10Ks, 10Qs, annual reports, but looking at figures. What they tell me in terms of the kind of people even running the place, the kind of accounting decisions they make and so on, I was able to make that $1.7 billion transactions over the phone. Yesterday was the first time I met the people and their board of directors had actually approved the deal a week earlier. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, I couldn't have done that if I hadn't have, uh, you know, uh, had a great time at Ray Dean's class. 53 years ago. So if I'm, if I'm going to tout one thing, aside from this particular leadership class, of course, uh, <laughs> if I'm going to tout one thing, uh, I, I, would, I, would, I would tell you that uh, get comfortable with it. You know, it, 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 uh, it may not happen the first week or the first month in the class, but, but get very comfortable with accounting. So that I run into CEOs periodically uh, who really don't understand it. You know, they try to bluff their way through and uh, you can just see, you can see in their faces, they're frightened almost when they, somebody hands them a, a balance sheet or an income statement. They really don't know what it means and they have to count on somebody else. And that's something you shouldn't count on. We make all our acquisition decisions ourselves. I mean, we don't call in consultants or anybody. We don't call in investment bankers much to their disgust. Uh, no investment banking fees in the Clayton Holmes deal. Uh, because, you know, it's my responsibility running Berkshire to understand enough about our acquisition decisions uh, to make them uh, based on the numbers that I see and, and, and what I see there. Uh, this course, however, is about leadership, and I'd like to talk just for a minute about that, and then I'd like to really talk about whatever's on your mind, and I'll, uh, we'll get questions. But, you know, leadership, obviously, is, it's, a very, it's a very simple thing in concept. Uh, uh, my job as the leader of Berkshire Hathaway is to have visions and, and goals for the company overall, with a long time horizon attached to them, and then to get those goals accomplished through other people. That's what, that's what it's all about. I can't do it myself, so I have, to, I, have to, 
I have to know where I want us to get to. I have to see over the next mountain if possible. But then I have to get a lot of other people to look over that mountain with me and really do the job. I mean, they are the ones that get it accomplished. So it's, it's getting things done through other people. Now, Berkshire is like some, like many large corporations in certain ways, but it's really quite different in many ways. Uh, we have over 150,000 people now working for Berkshire Hathaway in dozens of companies uh, throughout this country primarily and even abroad a little bit. We have exactly 15.8 people in headquarters and Deb Ray came down with me today so we've only got 13.8 uh, there today and we're probably working just as well with those 13.8 as we would if Deb and I were in the office. But uh, that is a, that's an unusual organization. I mean we, we have dozens of operating managers, CEOs of their businesses out there running them today and they do it without any direction from the home office except for one very limited piece of direction that I give them which I'll get to in a second. But we have these people and they're, they're an unusual group of people running these businesses because most of them have sold their businesses to us and they're very, very wealthy. Three quarters of our managers do not need to work financially. They have no reason financially to work. Probably three quarters of them are worth at least $50 million and, and, and we have some that are worth in the billions. And yet these people jump out of bed every morning you know, and, and work and they work weekends and they love working. And why is that and what's the key to that? Well, it, the key really is the same reason I keep working. You know, I'm 72, I'm getting social security now so I, you know, I, 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 I should be in Florida, you know, pushing shuffleboard around or something of the sort. But, but, but I do what I can do, anything in the world I want to do, but what I want to do is run Berkshire Hathaway. Now why do I want to run it that way? There's a couple things. You know. A, I get to paint my own painting. You know, I go down there every day and I feel like, you know, I feel like Michelangelo there you know, working on the Sistine Chapel or something. Nobody else may think it's a great painting, but I get to paint my own painting. I do not have people second guessing me. I do not have people saying, why don't you use a little more red paint than blue paint? Why don't you paint a seascape instead of a landscape? I get to do my own thing. I get to, it's, it's, it's a form of creativity. It, it's, it's exactly like somebody feels it's a professional golfer or somebody feels it's a painter. They're not doing it for the money, primarily. Uh, they're doing it because they like doing something well and that they, it happens to be down the, down the uh, route of their talents. And the second thing I like, frankly, is I like, I like applause. I like appreciation. So I like having shareholders who feel good about what I've done. I mean, it's, you know, I have a 96-year-old aunt, uh, and uh, her husband went to the University of Nebraska, too. And she is, uh, you know, she, she has all her money in Berkshire Hathaway, and she counts on me. And she's out in, in Palm Springs now, and, and her whole net worth is in Berkshire. And I've got cousins, and I've got everybody in our family has got all their money in Berkshire. And so those people are counting on me, and that's kind of fun to have something where you can actually deliver for other people and change their lives in positive ways. As a matter of fact, we had a couple that nobody had ever heard of up until a few years ago. The Othmers in, in New York, they came from Omaha. Don Othmer went to Central High, Mid Othmer, uh, 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 not sure which high school she went to in Omaha, probably South High. They left $750 million when they died. Nobody had ever heard of them. And I think a substantial portion, yeah, went right to here to the University of Nebraska. It was probably a total surprise to the university uh, when they got, I don't know, you probably got $150 million or so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you should thank the authors, but nevertheless, I, you know, you see the money, you see good things happening out of it. So it's fun. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it beats, it beats playing golf every day or something of the sort. So I say, if that's what turns me on, what's going to turn on these managers that are out there running things like Clayton Holmes or, or we've got a company, Flight Safety, that trains more pilots than anybody in the world. Flight Safety is run by an 85-year-old man, Al Yulshi. Al started the company with $10,000 in 1951. It now trains four or five times as many pilots, as uh, non-military pilots, as, any, as anybody in the world. And he is there at 85, and then it's a matter of public record, he's got a billion dollars worth of Berkshire shares. He works seven days a week, he loves it. And he loves it for the same reason that I love what I do. He gets to do it his way. He buys these big simulators that you train pilots in. He doesn't have to check with me as to whether to spend $15 million for a simulator. 
He doesn't ask me. He knows so much more about it than, than, you know, than I do. Why, why in the world would he ask me? Well, I can't tell what kind of a plane I'm in you know, when I'm flying around. And, and Al is spending a couple hundred million dollars a year on simulators. Uh, so spending Berkshire Hathaway money, and he never checks with Omaha. He's never had to come to Omaha. Uh, for any kind of meetings, he runs his own business. And that's what he loves in life. And I let him do it. I mean, that's my contribution to it, is, is really turning loose his energies. And, you know, they were properly directed before we bought the company seven or eight years ago. Why, why should I think that, you know, he couldn't keep running it after that? And like I say, at 85, he's still running it. Uh, the second thing that our managers like, in addition to this painting their own painting, is, is they too love applause. I mean, I, I try to be, I, I, I report in my annual report accurately what they've accomplished, but they accomplished a lot. You heard Susan Jock, I think, uh, some weeks ago uh, here. Susan came to Borsheim's and she was making $4 an hour, $4 an hour. And at age, before she was 40, she became CEO of the second largest independent jewelry operation in the United States, you know, from four bucks an hour. But it's talent, you know, and, and Susan knows more about, I don't know anything about jewelry, you know, and, uh, uh, you could hand me a, a phony diamond or a real diamond, I couldn't tell the difference. But if I started telling Susan what to order in the way of jewelry, or if I started telling her what kind of terms to extend to customers, or who to hire, or anything like that, you know, she doesn't need that in life. She really owns Borsheim's, you know. We have the stock certificate, we get the profits, <laughs> we get accustomed to. Uh, <laughs> but it's her baby, it's her baby. She decides, you know, everything about that place. And, and so it's her creation. And that feeling of ownership is really extraordinary, and it's so much better. I mean, it's the way I like to work, uh, and it's the way, you know, it's the way, uh, Susan Jock likes to work, it's the way Al Yoshi likes to work. And Susan, like anybody else in this world, loves being appreciated. I mean, it should, there'd be something wrong with her if she didn't. And the truth is, nobody appreciates her more than I do. I mean, she is a talent. And, and we are lucky to have her, and we're lucky to have all of these other managers. So leadership at, at Berkshire really consists of taking a bunch of people who in a baseball uh, uh, analogy would be 400 hitters and just handing them the bat and just telling them to get up their plate and take a big swing. Uh, uh, there's very little to it beyond that. One thing I do is I send them a letter. We don't have meetings in Omaha. Some of our managers, they, you know, they, they're, they're, there aren't any meetings they, and no, there's no catechism or anything else. Once every two years I send them a letter. This is it. One and a, roughly one and a, one and a half pages or so. The only, the only instruction they get from us, they don't, they don't send budgets to us, we don't, we don't care about them. Some of the companies use budgets, some don't use budgets. We adjust to them. Some of the managers I talk to a couple times a week because they like to talk frequently. Some of them I talk to literally once a year because they don't like to talk to me. And whatever, you know, it's up to them. I, I, I adapt to them. The only thing I tell them, and this letter, which went out January 20th, 2003, it says it's been two and a half years since my last memo. Now, how many big companies have you have the managers out there have been two and a half years since they heard from the home office? It's been two and a half years since my last memo. Here are a couple things to keep in mind. And number one, and this is number one every time, this doesn't change. It won't change two years from now or four years from now or six years from now. Number one, we can afford to lose money, even a lot of money. We cannot afford to lose reputation, even a shred of reputation. Let's be sure that everything we do in business can be, be, be reported on the front page of a national newspaper in an article written by an unfriendly but intelligent reporter. In many areas, including acquisitions, Berkshire's results have benefited from its reputation, and we don't want to do anything that in any way can tarnish it. Last year, Berkshire was ranked by Fortune as the fourth most admired company in the world. This year, we were third in the United States. They just published it. It took us 37 years to get there, but we could lose it in 37 minutes. And that's the message. I mean, we, you know, we, we can lose money. It does, you know, nicer to make money, but we've got, we'll figure out ways to make money. But we can't lose a, we can't lose a shred of reputation because you don't get it back. And you can, I, I said 37 minutes, but you can lose it a lot faster than that. You can lose it in five minutes. And, 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 and in fact, I was talking to Bruce coming in and he did some work around Solomon Brothers and I went back there 11 years ago because this firm which had was this, it had the second largest balance sheet in the United States at, the, at that time. It was, it was a preeminent firm on Wall Street. John Goodfriend, who, had, who ran it, 
had his picture on the front of Business Week as the King of Wall Street. And in April, late in April 1991, he made a fateful decision. It was reported to him that an employee down the line had flim-flammed the U.S. Treasury, had broken some rules, tried to play games with him. And John did not report that fact to the Treasury or to the Federal Reserve or to the SEC or to anybody else. Uh, he didn't do anything wrong himself, but he just, he, he got behind the curve. He didn't report it. The president of the company, Tommy Strauss, didn't report it. If you saw that Katie Couric show on Sunday night on the Central Park Jogger, uh, Tom Strauss was on there, but Tom Strauss ended up getting, losing his, he was president of Solomon Brothers. John was chairman, John Goodfriend. Uh, they didn't do anything. They, they dawdled. And after a few weeks, the same guy that had done, committed the terrible acts earlier, on May 15th, he did the same thing again at a treasury auction. And now they were in this terrible pickle because they had known about this on about April 28th that this guy was a bad actor and they hadn't done anything. And now on May 15th, he does the same thing again. And now if they go, they, they start feeling if they go and talk about it, you know, the people will say, well, why weren't you in here before? So they just kept trying to shove it out of their mind and do other things. And it came within inches of destroying the firm. It destroyed their careers. I mean, John Goodfriend, who spent 30 years in Wall Street and had a fine, re fine reputation, the king, the king of Wall Street was brought down by one simple, by one simple act uh, of omission. All he had to do was pick up the phone. Jerry Corrigan was head of the New York Fed. He had to pick up the phone and say, Jerry, you won't believe this, but this crazy guy in our Treasury Department, uh, Bonnie Mosier has just done this thing, and I'm terribly embarrassed, and what can we do to make it right? I mean, it, you know, and Jerry Corrigan, being Jerry Corrigan, would have turned red in the face and gotten very mad and issued a lot of language I couldn't repeat here. But in the end, he would have said, thanks for calling and telling us about it immediately, you know, and we'll slap a fine on you or do whatever is appropriate. And the, and, and the next day, the firm would have gone on fine. But, but John Goodfriend, actually, you know, a, a perfectly okay guy, but he just... He didn't act when it counted. And Tommy Strauss, who was number two, the same way. And later on, they were fined and, and uh, uh, in a certain way kicked out of the securities industry. And Solomon barely survived. 8,000 employees around the world uh, had their future in real jeopardy because of that single act. Uh, so just, just apply the newspaper test. That's a, I, I, I tell our managers, I could have a thousand page book of ethics. I could have all kinds of rules and hundreds of, you know, uh, but in the end, just all you got to do is think about, you know, do you really want what you're doing put on the front page of the paper tomorrow to be read by your parents, by your, by your spouse, by your kids, by your neighbors, by your coworkers? And if you're embarrassed about it, you know, just forget about it. At, uh, you know, the, you're all going to do well financially. You know, the nice thing about it is, you know, you live in America in the year 2003. You don't live in Bangladesh. You don't live in America, you know, of 1790 when it was... Uh, you live, in a, you live in a society which has a GDP of over 10 trillion, and you, you can just pick up the crumbs and you're going to do great. You know? <laughs> it's, you've all got the qualities. It, it takes three qualities essentially to do well, and extremely well, actually, in this country. It, it takes intelligence, it takes energy, and it takes integrity. Now, everybody in this room has the requisite intelligence. You wouldn't be here if you didn't. I mean, it doesn't take 180 IQs, although I'm sure you all have those. But uh, it, 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 takes, it takes reasonable intelligence. You're getting a great education. You've got the energy. That's why you're, you know, you've shown up uh, in school. And it takes integrity. And I say if you don't have integrity, you know, if we don't want to hire somebody that's got intelligence and energy if they don't have integrity. We'd rather hire somebody that's dumb and lazy. Uh, if they don't have integrity, because they probably never get around to cheating us or doing something. <laughs> so, uh, last thing in the world I want is, is somebody that's lax. And uh, Mosier had intelligence and energy at, at Solomon. He was, he was head of the government bond trading thing. And he had lots of intelligence and he had lots of energy. And he went to jail. Uh, and, he, and he almost brought down the firm. So, and integrity is absolutely an option. You, know? you may not be able to throw a football 60 yards. And, you know, you may not be able to run the 100 in 9-8. In, in you know, you may not be able to sink three point, pointers from, but you can choose where you stand on the integrity scale. You, know, you, can't, you, know, you weren't born wired one way or the other. That is an absolute choice you make. Uh, and 
the heroes I've had in life have been the people that I felt stood out in that respect. My number one hero was my dad, but I've had other heroes, Tom Murphy, Ben Graham, people like that. And the reason I admired them was not because they were the smartest people in the world, although they were plenty smart, and it wasn't, it wasn't because they made the most money. That meant nothing. It's really because I felt they were the classiest people that I ever met in my life. I mean, I saw them behave over year after year after year in a way that I could write their story on the front page of any newspaper and even in an unfriendly tone, and I, I could not do anything that would embarrass them in the least. They, they behaved extraordinarily well. And having the right heroes, you know, is, is terribly important. You know, you tell me who a 10-year-old's heroes are, and I can give you a pretty good prediction about, about how they're going to turn out. You want to choose your heroes very carefully uh, because you're going, to, you're going to look like them at some point. Uh, and you're lucky if you've, got, if you've got the right ones. I'll give you an aside, and then we'll get on to your questions. But it's something, you know, you're not parents yet, most of you. But if you, when you're a parent, you are the natural hero of your child. I mean, you, I mean, you know, you're this great big thing here. There's two of you great big things, and there's a little tiny child dependent on you. Right? You are the natural hero. And, and anything to get to school, subsequently, or anything else, they're going to be shaped more by what they see in this behavior of, of yours toward them than, than, than anything that will impact them uh, later in their lives. And if uh, uh, they want you to be the hero, you can destroy them, of course. And you, you know, you've seen it done many, many times. But, but actually, if the, if the parents are proper heroes, the, the child is about 90% of the way home. And uh, you know, you're lucky if you've had parents like that. And you can be that to your children, or you can, you can be something else. And uh, you're shaping that person. That, that, that it's nice to learn accounting when you get to Nebraska, but, but the behavior model that you take on is, is incredibly important. Let's talk about what's on your mind now. The, you can ask, ask tough questions. It's more fun for me. And uh, they can be about business. They can be personal. They can be political. You, know, you, you pick it out. And, When you were rejected from uh, Harvard Business School, uh, it's obviously somewhat of a failure in your mind. How did you uh, how do you adapt to your failures in life to make you more successful? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a very good question. You know, how do you turn failure into a plus? Uh, and it's true. When I was at the University of Nebraska, one day I was reading the Daily Nebraskan, and it said in room 300 or something, at three o'clock there will be this panel of three. Uh, uh, professors here at the university, and they're going to award the Nathan Gold Scholarship. I don't know whether you still, you still have that around? And at the time, uh, it said it would give you $500 to go to the graduate school of your choice. I don't know whether it's changed in amount, but, but that, that was it. So I read this, and I went there to this room at 3 o'clock that day, or whatever it was, and I walked in the room, and there were the professors. And I was the only student that showed up. I mean, it really got to them. I mean, they, they were stuck. They, you know, they kept waiting and looking at their watch and hoping there would be more candidates. But there, no one came in. So I won $500 by, by default. And, uh, and those are usually my biggest triumphs when nobody else shows up. Uh, and, and so here I was. I had $500 to go toward any, it wasn't, it wasn't limited, it was any, any graduate school uh, for a master's degree. So I applied to Harvard. My dad wanted me to. And uh, uh, I shortly heard from Harvard, and they said, go to Chicago and meet this fellow running that, who interviews applicants from the Midwest. So I got on the train, you know, and that's what you did in those days, and I spent about 10 hours on the Burlington going to Chicago. Then I transferred to another little interurban train to go up to this country day school where this fellow was the headmaster, and he was the big interviewer for Harvard. And I got there, and after about 10 minutes, he he said, better think about something else. But, uh, you know, he uh, come back later on. I, I was 19 at the time, and uh, I looked about 12, you know, and, and, I, and I acted about 8. Uh, so <laughs> it was not a great combination. Uh, but so he, he said, forget it. So I spent, uh, took the little interurban train back to Chicago, and I took the 10 hour train back to Omaha, and all the time I'm thinking, you know, what do I tell my parents? You know, it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, but, it was, it was the luckiest thing that ever happened to me. I, because if I'd gone to Harvard, I would have gone to a two-year business school. 
I, I, I instead applied to Columbia, where I could graduate in one year and get a master's degree. Luckily, that by the accident of it and being in the Nebraska National Guard, which did not get called up for the Korean War, I missed going in the Korean War. I, I got to meet Ben Graham, and, which had an enormous effect on me subsequently. And I probably got my wife that way because she was going to Northwestern. And I was able to put on sort of a full court press because I got out in one year. And otherwise, uh, she'd, she'd have met some other guy. I mean, I, I got her before the competition showed up. And uh, <laughs> so it worked out wonderfully. It couldn't have worked out better. And that's been, that's been my life, basically. I mean, it, the things, you know, you will get some disappointments, you know. Uh, but the future is what counts. It would not be fun if I knew every decision I was going to make was going to be perfect. It would not be as much fun. It would be like playing golf and knowing you're going to hit a hole in one on every hole. You wouldn't play golf if every time you got on a tee, you just took a swing and the ball ended up in the hole. You know? It would be fun for a few days you get, get on TV, but it, the, the game would not be any fun. Uh, so it's failure, you know, and I wouldn't even consider them failures, but they're, they're mistakes or whatever you want to call them. They're, they're part of the game, and in the end, you know, you go on and, and we made plenty of mistakes in business, we'll make plenty more. And then, the, you know, the Babe Ruth and, you know, for a long time, it subsequently got eclipsed by a few fellows, but uh, he held the record for strikeouts, you know, he also held the record for home runs and was the highest paid baseball player until the modern era came along. Yeah, so it's, it's part of the game. If you take big swings, you know, you, you, you may, you may, uh, you're going to miss sometimes. Um, but the... Uh, you know, the Harvard thing, you'll get a kick out of this, uh, maybe, I, I, they invited me back to the 25th anniversary of this class to talk to them, uh, and I went back. It was, it was kind of embarrassing because this was the 25th reunion, and, and the class was talking about the next 25 years to these alumni that were back after 25 years, and my job was to talk about the next 20, the, the, your financial future in the next 25 years. This was in, whenever it was, in the mid-70s, and right before me on the program, Masters and Johnson were talking about the next 25 years of their sex lives, so nobody stayed around for, for my talk. But that night, that night at the uh, at the alumni meeting, they, uh, uh, the fellow was president of the class, and he said, "You know, we're big enough to make admit when we make mistakes around here, and we turn this guy down and throw him back in the water." And uh, so now we'd like to make him an honorary member of the class. Uh, so they did it, and they voted, and everybody voted for it. And I stood up and I said, uh, "I recited the story that I told you," and I told him, you know, I said. At the time, I was kind of philosophical about this. You know, I was young, and maybe my grades weren't that good or something. And so I took the, took the rejection kind of well. But I said, now that I've met the people that got in the class, I'm really sore. <laughs> <laughs> OK, who's next? <laughs> yeah. You, you can ask it. I'll repeat it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, really, I only want the, the minister to say one thing at my funeral. If he gets up there, and they play a few little hymns and everything, uh, maybe they'll play There Is No Place Like Nebraska, that'd be great. I just want him to stay up there and say, my God, he was old. You know? <laughs> I'll settle for that. <laughs> but the truth is that, to some extent, Berkshire is my creation. So I would like people, to the extent that people regard that well, that's what counts. I mean, that's my painting. And, and, and I hope that people look at, I've been running out for almost 38 years, about, just about 38 years exactly, and that means I've only got another 30 or 40 to go. And uh, I hope that, uh, that we have done some things differently than other corporations. We've operated on a, on a different model. And I hope two things about it, actually. I hope, A, that that people realize that that model works and why it works and so on, because it, is, it does conflict with certain management theory uh, over the years. And secondly, uh, the, the important thing is that it, that it lasts well beyond me. I was down at Walmart six months ago and talked to their management group, and it was, I had a great time. What is really astounding, I voted for Walmart as the most admired company in the, in the country last year. That was my, that's where my vote went. 
It was astounding what Sam Walton built, starting in Bentonville, Arkansas with a pickup truck, taking on J.C. Penney and Kmart and Sears and all of these people with no money, you know, no real estate, no preference with vendors, no credit card lists, anything. He just took them on and of course he just ran, ran away from them. But the really impressive thing about Walmart is that Sam died about 11 years ago and that, uh, there had been no momentum lost. I mean, what he instilled in that company, nobody else could have built it like Sam, but David Glass first and Lee Scott now as the CEO, they have kept that company with its special culture uh, going at full steam ever since. And that, that's really what I hope you know, happens with Berkshire, and I've tried to think about ways to, to make that happen. But the real test will be if 10 or 20 years after I die, the, the special culture that I think is part of Berkshire is not only just as strong as ever, but even stronger. Uh, we have a situation at Berkshire where in 38 years, we got all kinds of CEOs up there running all kinds of businesses, three or four of them in Omaha, we have never had one CEO ever leave us, period, uh, to go someplace else. I mean, it, I, don't think, I don't know that there's any place like that in the country. So it's, it's been a, and we've never issued a stock option. You know, uh, you, know you read in the papers that you, you know, you gotta have stock options to attract quality people, all that sort of thing. I mean, we, we never had, we've never had a, uh, had a share of them. And, 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 and in the end, I don't know how many dozens of managers we're talking about, but no one has ever, has ever left uh, for another job. And, uh, some have been offered way more money. Uh, in fact, a G. Jane, who runs our ins reinsurance operation, probably could have increased his income ten times, tenfold. Now he's already making many millions, but but tenfold. But he doesn't want to leave, and that is the culture that I hope we can maintain, and that's what I'd really like to be. Uh, you know, if I've done anything to contribute to that. Uh, continuing after I die, that would that would be terrific. Of course, I, I I actually plan to keep managing Berkshire after I die. You have to understand that. <laughs> I, I have given all the managers Ouija boards. You know, I've, I've I've got these dark rooms they're going to go into, and I'll be there. <laughs> Mrs. B at, at the Rastafarian Park worked till 103 at Berkshire, and she's she's sort of our example. And and then she then she uh, took off from work, and she died the next year. So it's very dangerous to to uh, quit as early as that. <laughs> I, 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 am, I, am I supposed to be calling on these people? Okay, good. <laughs> How do you determine via your personal finances what organizations or foundations do you give your money to? On personal finance, how, how do I handle them? Or? Right. How do you determine what, where you make your donations? Oh, well, uh, we've got a, 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 there's a Buffett Foundation. Uh, eventually it will have everything. I mean, basically everything I've made will go back to society. America's been done it for me and, you know, it, it should, that's where it should go. Uh, uh, I have, I've got about an eight-page letter that the trustees have already seen. And so there's very few trustees, I don't believe in large groups of people making decisions, it gets to be, it, you know, sort of descends to the lowest common denominator. So there's only, what, maybe five or six trustees. Uh, interestingly enough, not just by accident, but I picked the people who I trust in the most in terms of both their intelligence but also their quality uh, to run it after I have people I feel the surest of, uh, a significant majority will be women. It'll be a women, woman controlled foundation and probably the largest foundation in the world at the time. Uh, but with a very small number of manager, uh, trustees. I have, in, in my letter, I tell them that I'm not going to give them any specific instructions as to what to do with the money. Uh, I tell them that their judgment above ground will be better than my judgment six feet underground. So uh, in the end, I want them but I want them to do a couple of things. I want them to attack really big, important causes. I don't want them to give a million dollars here and a million dollars there and everybody that, you know, that asks that they know and that sort of thing. So I don't want them doing things with an eyedropper. Uh, I want them to swing, take very big swings. And then I want them to measure what they're doing by the importance of what they're doing as contrasted to the natural funding constituency for that. Now, take in the health field. I mean, you've got the National Institute of Health spending billions and billions of dollars. You've got all kinds of money going into medical research. It'd be crazy, in my view, for the Buffett Foundation to be engaged in medical research. It's not that the subject isn't important, but there's already a huge funding constituency. 
It would be crazy for the money to go to Harvard or something of the sort. It isn't, it isn't a fine educational institution, but you've got all of these people that, that give money to Harvard, and they've got a rich alumni base and all of that sort of thing. So I want the combination of a terribly important program and the lack of a natural funding constituency. Well, where do you find that? You find that with unpopular causes to, to quite a degree. Uh, Rockefeller felt somewhat the same way. It's, it's interesting. He was the first major patron of any sort of, of black colleges in the United States. Now, if you think about it, black colleges had no funding constituency. I mean, their, their alumni didn't have any money, basically. I mean, if you go back 75 or 100 years. So there wasn't any money coming. People didn't, you know, they didn't build great businesses and then, and then leave tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to the institution. And it was, was self-perpetuating. And so Rockefeller stepped in, and he, he took a group of black colleges and funded them in a very, very big way. And I, I, I admire that kind of a decision enormously. It otherwise, nothing would have happened. And, and that's what I hope the trustees of the, the Buffett Foundation do. I was with Bill Gates last week, uh, with, and I consider his foundation, he and Melinda together, because they're equal partners in it, I consider their foundation to be the most logical fo big foundation in the world. They're giving away about a billion dollars a year. Now, Bill said to, and Melinda said to themselves, how do we save the most lives per dollar spent in the world? And they decided that in certain major medical areas, that what was being done abroad in many countries was zilch in terms of these things that were easily preventable by vaccines or various other things. And they decided they could save huge numbers of lives per billion dollars spent. But they'd be spending it you know, in places like India and, all, and Africa, where they would get no credit in the United States. I mean, no buildings with their name, no nothing. But that was their metric. And that's, that's Bill's sole metric. I mean, he, he doesn't want to talk about, you can go to him with some proposition to stick his name on something you know, for $50 million. It doesn't interest him at all. He is, it's a totally rational one. And he pours himself into it. Uh, he, he has educated himself on, on medicine, and particularly medicine outside the United States in a way that I've never seen anybody. And I've got good news for you. This you should write down. On May 2nd, on public broadcasting, there will be a program uh, where Bill, with Bill Moyers, Bill Moyers is interviewing him, and Bill explains his philanthropic thinking. And it, it, I, I went there. It was taped at Columbia University. And in fact, you may even see me in the audience sitting next to him a little bit. The, that, that is, it's going to be a great program. Uh, they took about an hour and 20 minutes, and it's going to get edited down to 56 or 58 minutes. But you will hear as you will hear as cogent an argument of, for rational philanthropy on that program as you'll ever hear in, in, in your life. So I, I, it's it's interesting. That program came about because about two years ago, I asked Bill a question at a group I get together, something akin to what you asked him. I asked him to talk about the evolution of his philanthropic thinking. And there were a group of about 60 of us there, and he talked to us, and I mean, it was a fabulous talk. And I, I just, I said, you know, you got to get that out in the public domain somehow. So, so this thing with Bill Moyers does that. Uh, if I die tonight, all my Berkshire shares, which are 99% of my net worth plus, go to my wife. Uh, she dies first, hers go to me, and then it all goes to the Buffett Foundation, and it will then be active on a on a very big, big scale, and those are the guidelines, and uh, who knows what those problems will be. I mean, it, will, it probably, it might well have been civil rights in the early 60s. I mean, it, the, the civil rights organizations, you know, were not being funded by anybody, and I mean, it, money wasn't the big problem, but it was a problem for, in the civil rights arena, and uh, uh, there was no natural funding constituency for that. It was an important, very important issue, but it was an unpopular issue in many respects. Uh, and it seems to me that's where the money, money should go, particularly if you have it on a big scale where you can really do something. Uh, depends when I die, but, but you know, 10 or 15 years from now, the foundation could really, I mean, it could have a lot of money. And, and uh, uh, so they could do some things that nobody else could attempt. And it won't be what people want them to do. You know, that's the nature of it. If it was what people wanted to do, it already be being done. Uh, interesting thing, the contrast between business and philanthropy is interesting. In business, I swing at easy pitches. I stand there at the plate, and if I like pitches one inch above my navel, right in the center of the plate, I can wait and wait and wait because there's no called strikes. You know, as long as that bat's on my shoulder, nobody's calling a strike. 
If, if the pitcher throws me General Motors at 36, IBM at 82, Microsoft at 25, and I don't swing, it's not a strike. It's not a hit either, but it's not a strike. I, only when I swing is it a strike. So I wait for easy pitches. I wait for things I understand are exactly in my sweet spot. Philanthropy is just the opposite. You're looking at the toughest problems the world faces, and they're intractable to some extent. I mean, these are tough, tough problems. And they have resisted the utilization of money over the years, and that's what makes them tough problems. I mean, the problems you can solve with money are the easy ones. It's the problems you can't solve with money. So they are very tough problems. One, one thing I've gotten involved in just a little bit recently is something that Sam Nunn is heading, Senator, the former senator, called the Nuclear Threat Initiative. And uh, essentially, I, Sam Nunn, who was, who was as well informed as anybody in the world on the subject and articulate and everything, is working on the problem of the nuclear materials uh, and or nuclear talent uh, that exists around the world that might become available to terrorists or to, to uh, governments uh, to impose on, on the rest of the society. And, and there, are, there are vast amounts of, of uh, uranium and lesser amounts of plutonium, and there's a lot of unemployed Russian scientists and so on. So this is something that Ted Turner actually set up a couple of years ago and got Sam to handle. And, because AOL Time Warner stock, which was being used to fund it from TED, has gone down a lot in price. They, they, they've run short of money. So that's, that's something I'm involved in. It doesn't, uh, you know, it's not something that has any popular appeal. You can't raise, you can't send out something to get hundreds of thousands of people to respond. But, but uh, that's the kind of thing that I think you know, the foundation should be doing. Yeah? Um, with the government possibly considering eliminating double taxation on dividends, would you ever consider Yeah, the question is, would the government, uh, considering eliminating the double taxation on dividends, would that change our attitude at Berkshire toward, toward paying dividends, and what sort of decision-making uh, framework do we have about whether we pay dividends or not? Uh, Berkshire, I took it over in 1965, and we paid 10 cents a share one year. It happened in the late 60s. I, I can't remember it. I blocked it out of my mind. I'm assuming in the men's room or something, but, because uh, that was the only dividend we paid. Uh, the determination is very simple on dividends, is can we retain a dollar or a billion dollars or whatever the amount is of earnings and have that dollar become worth more than a dollar uh, in immediate present value? Now, even though it may not get used for a few years or something of the sort. In other words, are we, is that dollar worth more than a dollar if kept in the business? Forgetting about taxes entirely, let's assume a total tax-free society uh, in terms of dividends. And the answer to that so far has been yes. We have kept the dollars that we've earned, and we have created more than a dollar of market value for every dollar we've retained. And as long as we can do that, it's silly to pay out a dollar, even if it's not taxed, and put it in the, my pocket, or it's still only worth a dollar if I can create more than a dollar's worth of value in the stock. So we have done that now for a lot of years. It doesn't mean we can do it forever but we've done it for a lot of years, and that, that is the test. And it, you will find in the back of the Berkshire Hathaway Annual Report, which we'll be glad to send to any of you, uh, it's on the internet also, but you'll find in the back of the uh, Berkshire Report something that isn't in any other report that I know of. It's something called the Economic Principles of Berkshire Hathaway. That's been in the report every year now for at least 20 years. And those principles don't change. That's why they're principles, you know, and, and it's why I'm willing to lay them out. I mean, if, if I act in conflict with those principles, I expect the owners to, you know, to call me on it. But I look at the investors in Berkshire as my partner. Now, I'm the managing partner. They can't, because I own so much stock, they can't do much about me. Uh, so they ought, to, they ought to know what the game is when they, if they join us. And that doesn't mean everybody wants to join us, but they ought to know what the rules are, just as if you and I were starting a partnership and I was going to run it, you'd want to know you know, how we were going to conduct business and what my thoughts were and what my time horizon was, would we ever sell, would I make distributions, all that kind of thing. So that, those principles cover this point you raised. I don't forget whether it's the third or fourth one or something like that, but, but it's, it's explained there. And I want people to under, I want our owners to understand it. I mean, I, I look at every owner, when I write my annual letter to shareholders, which takes me an ungodly amount of time, I mean, it's miserable, but uh, nevertheless, it's important because it is the one time a year I'm talking to my partners. And when I started out, I actually mentally put Dear Doris and Bertie, because those are my sisters. And 
They have all their money in Berkshire. They're smart, they're, but they're not financial types. I mean, they're not spending their time on that. And I, and I essentially want to be talking to them as bright people who don't know a lot of financial jargon necessarily, you know, but they're, but they'll, but they're interested enough that they'll read a lot because they got all their money in it. So I, I don't have to worry about keeping it short or anything like that. If, I, if I'm talking about their money, I've probably got their interest. And I, I take that off at the very end and then I take off your doors and burden up to the shareholders of Berkshire. But I want to tell them exactly what they're in. I want it to be just as if our roles were reversed. That's always the test. If Doris and Bertie were running the place, and I was living in Carmel, California, like Bertie is, what would I want to hear from them, the managers? And I would, one of the things I'd want to hear is just exactly the question that you asked. You know, what is the, what is your attitude about distributing money from the, from the company? Because I get to make that decision along with the board of directors, and they don't. And some managements withhold money that really belongs to their owners because they like building a, a kingdom. Some of them you know, do it out of fear or anything like that. I think I'm doing it for a rational reason, and I want to explain that reason, but I tell them how to test me on that, too, because I think I should be tested. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a very important uh, relationship that really has deteriorated over the years, in, in my view, between management and owners. I mean, I, you, you've, you've seen in the last 10 years a slippage, in my view, of the behavior of American CEOs. I mean, obviously, all kinds of exceptions, but uh, it's very interesting because they're not crooks or anything. Most of them, there's a few, and they've gotten a lot of publicity lately. But nevertheless, they have behaved as most humans do. They've sort of picked up the behavior of those around them. That's why it pays, pays to hang out with people better than you are. I mean, you know, if you hang out with people better than you are, you'll become better yourself. At uh, uh, Everybody behaves better that's around my wife. You know, I mean, even including me, <laughs> starting from a low base. Uh, but the, she just has that effect on people, and other people pull you down. I mean, you know, when I was in the National Guard and we would go to camp, you know, in about an hour I was reading comic books. You know, <laughs> pretty soon everybody's reading comic books. The language, you know, the, uh, you know, every every other word becomes some form of profanity. Everything it just you just sink. Well, what happened to American CEOs in the, in in the 90s is that they they the behavior, the situational ethics sort of cause behavioral norms to, to sink. I say it's a little like how Mae West described her career. She said, I was snow white, but I drifted. Uh, and American management drifted uh, to, to quite a degree during that, during that period. Uh, uh, I, think it's a, I think it's very important, you know, what that relationship is. People have given you their money at Berkshire Hathaway or any other company. And, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, a trustee for them, in effect. And then the question is, they ought to, since I control the place, they ought to know the yardsticks. So if you do go to our website, go to the back of the report, and there's something that says economic principles, and we try to discuss everything that's important. And I tell them I'm going to put them in there every year so that they can, you know, they can hold me accountable. Yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, the question is about the personal qualities we look for in the, in the executives we place at our various companies. Uh, the first thing is we don't usually place them. I mean, they come with them. Uh, we don't have anybody to place. So I have the problem occasionally, if somebody dies, or, uh, to re replace uh, a CEO. But most of our CEOs came with a deal. Clayton Homes, which we're, <clears throat> we're buying, comes with Kevin Clayton running, running it. We will put no one in there. He will run the place just as before. But in terms of the personal quality, when, when, a, when a seller comes to me with a business, whether it's Clayton or any of the, the others, Ike Friedman at Borsheim's, uh, Mrs. B at Nebraska Furniture Mart, when they come to me, the first question I have to ask myself, because I'm counting on them to run the place, I have to decide, what do they love the money or do they love the business? Now, there's nothing wrong with liking the money. I mean, they all like money, but, but they've got to love the business. They've got to have a passion for it. Because if I give them a whole bunch of money and they love the money and they don't love the business, no matter what they tell me, six months from now they'll be gone. You know, I mean, they'll just all of a sudden say, "Why am I getting up at seven in the morning just so I can send a lot of money to Omaha?" You know, I mean, it it just it, it won't work. So they have to love the business. I mean, I want people with a passion for the business. I used to say that I had a one-line employment form, one-question employment form. The question was, "Are you a fanatic?" 
You know, if you answered yes, you got the job. Because I want somebody who's fanatic about their business. You know, I mean, you want people that love teaching if, 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 if you're in a classroom. You know, you, if they don't have the passion for it, it, it doesn't work very well. So I, now, if they've got the passion, and, and our managers do, but, but not everybody would. Uh, the, the financial operators don't. We've never bought a business from an LBO operator, a financial operator. So they don't, they don't give a damn. I mean, they, all they want to do is make sure your check clears, and, and they're gone. And it isn't going to work if we try to buy from them. So we buy from these people who love their businesses. And, and then, really, my job is just to make sure that I don't mess it up and create conditions that cause them to quit loving it for some reason, because they come in loving it. Only I can, only I can mess it up. And they care about being treated fairly on compensation, but they don't measure it against everybody else. They don't have a lawyer they're negotiating with me. I mean, I don't have a compensation arrangement with any of these managers that can't be put in one paragraph. You know, and then I go to other companies where they have a lawyer come in and there's 80 pages, you know, and it, it tells what's happened, you know, how much they get paid in severance or they end up going to jail. You know, and, and I just, I won't deal with somebody that thinks that way. Uh, and, you know, that's fine. There's a self-selection process in terms of, of who comes to us. There's this invisible filter out there that causes the Claytons of the world, the Al Yoshis of the world, the Ike Friedmans of the world, the Mrs. B's of the world to come to us. When I made the deal with Mrs. B in 1983, Mrs. B had another offer from somebody else that was somewhat higher. And she just said, I don't care. She only owned 20% of the company. That she had four children, they each owned 20%. <laughs> She told him, you know, I'm selling to Mr. Buffett. <laughs> she was calling me Mr. Buffett up until when she was 104. Uh, and in fact, when I walk in the store, she'd say, here comes my new young boyfriend, which I didn't, I, I don't get that a lot of places, I can tell you. <laughs> the, uh, uh, but she, you know, she, she built this thing. She came over here in 1921 or two. She landed in Seattle with a tag around her neck. She couldn't speak a word of English. Said Fort Dodge, Iowa. She couldn't, she couldn't communicate. She just had the tag. The American Red Cross got her out to Fort Dodge. And for two years, she got no place because nobody, nobody spoke the Russian, and, or, or Yiddish, actually. And, and so she moved to Omaha just to be around some other Russian Jews who she could at least talk to. She learned the English language when her oldest daughter, Frances, would go to school and come home at night and teach her the words. And she started out and she started sending 50 bucks at a time over to Russia to bring her siblings. She had seven siblings and her mother and father to get them over here. After 16 years, she brought all the family over. She saved $500 in 16 years, you know, peddling, used clothing, whatever. And she started in the rest of the furniture with $500. And it's now the largest home furnishings complex in the world. And it all came from the $500 and a very you know, special woman. And can you imagine? Building something like that and selling it, you know, to some financial operator who's going to resell it, you know, and try and go public with it a couple of years later, and it, it, you know, it meant something to her. She wanted it to continue like it has continued, and it's that's those are the kind of people we want to attract. It isn't so much me selecting them; it's them selecting Berkshire. I mean, that's that's the key. And and frankly, we've gotten to that position in this country where the people that do care about their businesses, good sized businesses. There's no second choice beyond besides Berkshire. We we get them. You know, they they come to us. We had a woman, Doris Christopher, come to us last year. Doris Christopher, in 1980, had two little girls, lived in Chicago, lived in a probably twenty thousand dollar house, and she and her husband both worked. She's looking for something to do to make a little extra money. She thought about catering and decided that it would take her away from the kids too much. So she decided that what she knew best, though, was she'd been a home ec teacher. She knew cooking, and, uh, and she knew the kitchen and what was useful to people. So she borrowed $3,000 on her life insurance policy. That's all she had. She went down to the merchandise mart in Chicago and said, what's the least amount of this utensil or that utensil the manufacturer would sell, usually a dozen. And she took them home, and then she, got the, she had the idea that she would hold these parties, essentially, in people's homes. And so she arranged with a woman suburban Chicago to hold the first party, she almost turned back. She started driving there, she thought, oh, they'll laugh at me and I'll knock the stuff over and they won't buy it, you know, what you do. She was very unsure of herself. But she went there, she sold, I think, $175 worth of goods that night. Uh, she sold me her business last year, and uh, that business, business made $140 million pre-tax from this $3,000 investment. 
company. That woman had a passion for her business, and she understood her customer, and she loved her customer, and she loved the people that worked with her. She got 67,000 associates. It's called the Pampered Chef, some of you may have been to a Pampered Chef party. And almost one woman out of 10 in the United States bought something from us last year. And uh, now, unfortunately, I have to acknowledge that she probably didn't understand accounting that well. <laughs> but she understood her customer, and she understood people. And, and, and she, likes, she likes people. You know, I, I met her one time, but she, when she wanted to sell her business, there wasn't anybody else to sell to as far as she was concerned. She, just, she came to Omaha. We made a deal in a few minutes. Uh, we made a, a compensation deal. It took us you know, 15 seconds. She's running the business. I've never been there. They're in Chicago. I hope they're there. I mean, <laughs> we, we paid a lot of money for this. I mean, someday we'll buy a business and there'll just be some guy in a closet someplace saying, you know, what figure shall I send Warren this month? But, but uh, I've never been there. You know, I, I've met her and I've seen the results of what she's done. And she is in love with the company. How do I value the business that Berkshire acquires? Well, the first thing I have to decide when somebody calls me is, is valuing this business within my circle of competence. I don't know how to value Microsoft. I don't know how to value Oracle. I mean, if, you know, Larry Ellison calls me or Bill Gates calls me and they don't. But if any of those, I don't know, I, I, or biotech or anything, I wouldn't know how to value it. I just, you know, I wish them well and tell them, you know, I think it's worth twice as much as they think it is, but I'm just not in the mood to buy today. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, so it has to be within my circle of competence. My circle of competence is, you know, businesses I can understand. And when I say understand, I don't mean understand how to use a computer or not use a computer in terms of a computer company. I mean understand what the economic characteristics of the business are and what the company's really going to look like in 5 or 10 or 20 years. Uh, Bill Gates will tell you that, that he, be, you know, if, if he were investing, he would buy Merck Berkshire rather than Microsoft because it's, it's so much easier to understand what our businesses are going to look like, whereas he's in a business where you're going to really have to be doing things differently over time. So I know that Wrigley's is going to be the number one chewing gum in the country. I know Snickers is going to be the number one candy bar in the country 10 years from now. It's been the number one candy bar for 40 years. You, know, you don't have to be very bright to understand that when people lay out 50 cents for something that they stick in their mouth, that they're not about to experiment. You know? I mean, it's, so we, we try to look at businesses we can understand. Now, I, I got a call a year and a half ago from a fellow. I never heard of him in Denver. His name was Craig Ponzio. Craig called me up. And never heard of him. And he said, I've got a business that's your kind of business, and I'm gonna wa I want to sell it. Here's the reasons. Have to be have to do with health. And although I don't pay much attention to the reasons, uh, and he said, it, it's the leading company by far uh, in the custom picture frame business. And he said, let me tell you why. It has what I call durable competitive advantage. That's what I call durable competitive advantage. He says, let me tell you why it has it. He said, there are 18,000 people that frame pictures in the United States, little mom and pop operations. Every town, Lincoln will have a half a dozen, you know, Omaha will have a dozen, or, and they, they frame pictures. I go over to get a picture frame, and I hand it to somebody. I say, you, I follow their judgment. I say, you know, the biggest thing I want is I want a good looking frame, and I want, I want it back soon. I want, I want quick delivery. Well, with 18,000 people in that business, and a zillion kinds of picture frames. Nobody can carry a big inventory because they don't do that much business. I mean, it's not Walmart or something of the sort. Craig Ponzio graduated from a little school up in Wisconsin, went to work in a tiny little firm that made these things. Five or six years later, bought the place when it was doing $3 million a year. Now it does $300 million a year. And it totally dominates the wooden custom frame business. Why does it dominate it? It dominates it because it calls on these 18,000 people has a sales force calling on them six or eight times a year, and it has 22 plants around the country that can get the frame that the custom framer orders 85% of the time. If they order it by 5 o'clock today, they'll have it by 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Now, think of that coverage. That's what the customer wants. They don't care whether they pay $83 or $88 to get the thing framed. They, they, you know, you've got something you want done, and you want it done fast. And, the, and that little custom framer, those 18,000 people, they want happy customers. And that means speed of delivery and certainty and all that. You couldn't build a distribution system to compete with us. I mean, you know, it, just think of trying to build a distribution system starting from scratch that would take that business away from us. It can't be done. Well, Craig explained that to me in about 15 minutes. I'd never thought about the custom frame business, but I, you know, I framed pictures or had people frame it for me, and I understood the, the power of that. Uh, that was a Monday. Uh, I said, I think we can make a deal. So he came on Wednesday, 
He came at 9 o'clock and they left at 10 o'clock. We got a deal. I've never seen him since. You know, uh, he got the money promptly thereafter. He wasn't going to come to the annual meeting last year, but his wife was sick. He'll probably come this year. He's a good guy. And no one can knock us off in that business. Every time I buy a business, I say to myself, if I had a billion dollars and I wanted to go in and compete with these guys, could I knock them off? You know, if you gave me a billion dollars and you told me to dislodge Snickers as the number one candy bar in the country, I don't know how to do it. If you tell me I've got a billion dollars and I've got to make it, or five billion, and I've got to make it so that Wrigley's, Spearmint, you know, Double Mint, Juicy Fruit, all of those get knocked off the top selling gum list, I can't do it. Now, if you give me, you know, if you give me a billion dollars and tell me to knock off all the ladies' apparel shops in Lincoln, you know, I'll make mincemeat of them very fast. I mean, I have a very good business myself, but I can destroy that. And the, the real test is, you know, can some idiot with a lot of money destroy the business you've got if he decides to compete with you? And we, we try to buy businesses where no matter who comes along, you know, they've got this durable competitive advantage. Those are the three words that count. And you, can make that, you may be able to make that decision about companies that I can't make that decision about. They have to be pretty simple for me. But we buy things that, you know, we have Fruit of the Loom underwear, you know. Are people going to quit wearing underwear? Well, who knows? <laughs> but we, we sell 44% of all the men's and boys' underwear uh, that goes through Walmart and all of the mass merchandising chains. We've got the lowest costs around. Fruit of the Loom is a name that's been around since 1850 or 60. You know, you, if you can buy three pairs of shorts from us, or six pairs or whatever it is, for five and a half bucks and nobody's going to sell them cheaper, why are you going to buy anything else? Yeah. So we'll own that as, unless we mess it up some way. Yeah. Uh, we've got a very potent advertising uh, uh, slogan there. It's, we cover the asses of the masses. That's, that's <laughs> <it>. <laughs> it sort of gets to it, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, up there. Yeah. Could you repeat that just a little louder? I think I got most of it, but try, try me again. Okay. I'm going off your quote that says, um, do not take yearly results too seriously. Yeah. Instead, focus on four or five year averages. How have you applied this philosophy to your own life? Okay. Yeah. The question is, since I don't, since I say one or two years doesn't make much difference in business, but longer term does, how do I apply that in my life? Well, and I could probably give you some terribly philosophical answer on it, but the truth is, I get up every day and just do what I love doing. And, and, uh, you know, I want people around me to have good experiences, but you know, I, I, the truth is I don't spend most of my time thinking about that. I mean, I, I, really, I spend most of my time thinking about what can I do to keep Berkshire going the way it has gone. But I will tell you how to apply that, and, and it works reasonably well, I think, at Berkshire because we get this self-selection of people to join in. I mean, we have created a working environment where in 38 years nobody's left that runs it. So I, you know, I do feel good about that, obviously. I feel good about the results of the investors and, you know, the oftener's and those people. I mean, uh, actually, I think a fellow may write a book about what's happened with all the money that all these different people have uh, made in Berkshire. But I'll tell you the test on that, and, and it's a terrific question, it, because you will, when you get to my age, you will not measure how well you've done by how much money you've got. I can guarantee you that. You'll, you'll all do fine on money anyway. I mean, uh, you know, think about it. Seven hours a day, you know, you're in a bad night. You've got exactly the same mattress I've got. If you don't, we'll sell it to you at the furniture mark. You know, I mean, so, so that, I mean, we're not a parody. I can't, I can't outdo you, you know, in terms of my sleeping enjoyment. You can, you can match it by, by buying this mattress, which will give you a special price on Just mention my name. Uh, we eat at the same places, you know. We eat at Dairy Queen, particularly if you're in my position because we own it. But, but we eat at Donald's and Burger King, and, and when I leave here, I'll stop by a fast food place. Later. So our eating experiences are the same. We travel the same. I mean, I had a 10-year-old car up till about a year ago, you know, and it just doesn't make any difference to me. They, they, they all work. We live in a place that's warm in the winter and it's cool in the summer, and we watch the Super Bowl on big screen TV. You do it, I do it. You know, we dress more or less the same. I mean, I pay more for my clothes, but they look cheap when I put them on, so we're really on a, <laughs> we're, we're on a parody. Yeah. So, so the money isn't going to be that big a deal. Everybody in this country is going to, you know, the, with the intelligence this group has, the energy you have, you're going to do well. So what's the difference? What really counts? Well, I would say that you will measure, health is enormously important, and that's a matter of a fair amount of luck. I mean, you know, 
So I won't, I, won't, I don't want, I'm not shortchanging it, I'm just saying you can't do too much about that. But you will measure your success in life by whether, by how many, and extent, whether it's the people you want at 70 or whatever the age may be, you'll measure it by how many of them really love you, you know, in the end. I mean, you can't, you know, you, you, you can't buy love. I mean, it, it doesn't work. You can buy sex, you can buy testimonial dinners, you can buy your name on buildings, you can do all kinds of things. But the, you know, the only way you get to be, you know, love is to be lovable. It's kind of irritating, actually. If you've got a lot of money, it'd be more fun to just write out a check for a million dollars. Because everybody, you know, from now on loves me. But it doesn't work that way. And in fact, you know, it, it, the only way is to be, is to be lovable. And, and, you know, I've got this friend who, uh, who came out of Auschwitz and had a, at least one member of the family die there. And what is it now? It's uh, 60 years later. You know, she still, when she looks at people, it's a Polish Jew, when she looks at people, the question she asks herself in determining who she really trusts as friends, the one question in her mind is, would they hide me? Now, when you get to be 70, if you've got a lot of people that would hide you, you've had a successful life. I know people who have a tremendous amount of money, no one would hide. Their own kids wouldn't hide them. I mean, they, they really wouldn't. I mean, their business associates wouldn't or anybody else. If it really came down to it, you know, they, they don't have anybody's respect. They've got their attention, maybe, with money or something of the sort, but they, they, nobody loves them. And, uh, my friend Tom Murphy at Camp Cities TV, I mean, dozens of people would hide Murph, you know. All kinds of people would, would hide my wife, you know. At, uh, ben Graham, a lot of people would hide my, my dad, it, it would have had a number. And then, like I say, that I can, I can tell you people that, uh, you know, everybody may pay homage to them and the kids may put up with them and hope they don't change their will or something, but the truth is that nobody would hide them. And if you've got a lot of people that would hide you when you get to be 70, uh, you will have a very successful life. Okay, right in front. Um, throughout your life, what are some of the, your personal and career goals that you've set for yourself? And um, have, which ones have you accomplished and which ones are you still um, going after? Yeah, just in terms of personal goals or, or... Just goals that you've set for your life that you've accomplished. Yeah, well, I would... You know, the truth is the main goal I've had has been at Berkshire. I mean, you know, it, it might be more admirable to say that I was feeding the poor or something someplace in India, but it, it, it isn't true. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's been the focus of my life most of the time. The money will be, I think, used for very, very good purposes later on. I, I don't use any real amount of it myself. But actually, somebody else is going to do most of that, and, and I pick good people to do it. Uh, but, you know, I, I've got three kids of which I'm enormously proud, and they and they like each other, they get, you know, they, they do things together, they work, you know, the, the, the family unit works extremely well, but my wife gets 99.9% .9 of the credit for that. I mean, if you didn't turn out well under her, there's something really wrong with you. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, it's a life that's a lot of fun, but it's, I do what I enjoy doing. I, you know, it, it, uh, I, I play lots of bridge, on the internet because I, you know, I, I like to do that more than anything else. I used to do way more reading. I do a lot of reading, but I, I used to just read all the time. Now I spend 12 hours a week on the internet playing bridge, and I, you know, it's, it's great. I, I will talk to the Microsoft Summit here in about a month, and I tell this group, and there's all these high-powered internet types, and I tell them, look at, you know, you guys are all failures <laughs> because here I am, got all kinds of money, you know, I've been fooling around with the internet now for 10 or 12 years. I spend 12 or 14 hours a week on it, mostly bridge, but I do, you know, the Google searches and if I'm writing a talk, I look up all kinds of, all kinds of information on it. And you know, I read the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, 10 o'clock the night before, and all these things. And you guys are getting exactly 120 bucks a year out of me. <laughs> I mean, that is a failure. I, they have not figured out how to get any money out of me. And, and I, I gave them this talk last year, and this year I'm going to go back there and say, you, you've made no progress at all. You know, I'm, <laughs> it's 120 bucks last year, it's 120 bucks this year, and in between I've had 600 hours of enjoyment and learned all kinds of things. Uh, so I, I, I do enjoy, you know, that, I enjoy that more than anyone. Now, when I was young, I thought I had a lot of money. I, you know, I, I don't professional sports team and I play golf all the time, maybe have my own private golf course and all kinds of things. It just doesn't mean anything to me, you know. I, I, I have something where 365 days a year 
Everything is good. I work around terrific people. One of them was here today that came with me and drove me down. And uh, I mean, I get to select the people I work with. That's a huge, huge luxury. I mean, literally. Just think of if you had to work for a boss you couldn't stand, you know, or work around people because your stomach could churn. It is what, I mean, it'd be miserable. So the ultimate luxury, really, is doing something every day that you love doing with people that you love doing it with. And, and I've got that, and, uh, you know, by accident to some extent. I say if you, if, you, if you take on a job just to make a lot of money and it causes your stomach to churn, you know, and you go home at night and kick the dog and all that sort of thing, you know, that, that's a little bit like marrying for money. You know, it's, it's probably a bad idea under any circumstances. But if you're already rich, it's crazy, right? I mean, if I marry for money, I mean, I would have my head examined. And, and what's it going to do? You know, and, and so it, it's, you know, it's, it is, and we're lucky in this country. I mean, we won what I call the ovarian lottery when we were born in this country. You know, it was four times or likely you would have been born in China, just about as likely you'd have been born in Bangladesh. You know, you're born in the greatest society in the world, so make the most of it and have a good time. Let's see, who's had, uh, okay, up there. You two guys are next to each other, you can fight it out. <laughs> what does, whether it be professionally or personally, kept you and your business in Omaha or in the state of Nebraska? Well, I, yeah, that's a good question. Why do I stay in Omaha? Well, I love it. And, uh, you know, my, my grandfather went to Central High, my dad went there, my wife went there, my kids went there, and now my grandchildren are there. They, they all, they, my grandchildren say they, they, they have the same teacher that my grandfather had. <laughs> the, 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 uh, but there's continuity, there's friends, there, there, there's all kinds of things. I mean, there's no disadvantage to being in Omaha. I mean, I like New York when I'm there. I've got a house in California, you know, and I, I get around some, but I can't imagine anything better. I mean, I, I, uh, you know, what, what doesn't it have? I have a home. I've never sold a house in my life. I have, I have a home I moved into in 1958, so I've been there, what, 45 years or so. I'm five minutes from the office. I moved into the office in 1962. I've been in there 41 years. We've just gotten, so we take, an, a, we take a whole floor. It's taken us 41 years to where we can use a whole floor. <laughs> kind of discouraging. Uh, but there, there I am, five minutes from the office. Everything's easy, and it all works. I know all my, I, you know, I've known the doctors all my life. I've known everybody. At, uh, uh, I feel connected. Uh, my aunt taught in the public school system in Omaha. I, I named a scholar. I'm, uh, prize that I give after her, but I mean, it all means something. And I've lived in New York for a couple of years. I've lived in Washington, D.C. for some years. I never felt that kind of connection at all. So and there's absolutely no disadvantage. You know, I, to, uh, you know I, I get the same information. Actually, with the, with the Internet and, you know, and Bloomberg and all that, I, I, no one can get any information any faster than, than I can get it. And uh, there's just no downside. And I think it's been a terrific environment for my kids to grow up in. I mean, my kids have grown up in a neighborhood, perfectly normal neighborhood. I mean, you know, no fences around it, no, you know, no golden ghettos or anything of the sort. They've gone to an integrated public school. School has probably had between 20 and 30 percent black students for 75 years. They have great teachers. You know, I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, part of education is a total life experience. And uh, I think it's great that we have a good public school system in Omaha. I mean, if, if, if I lived in Washington or Los Angeles or New York, I'd have to send my kids to private school. I wouldn't want to do that. Uh, I'd do it because I wouldn't send them to a vastly inferior school just to prove some point. So, but the nice thing about it is I haven't had to make that choice in Omaha. I've got classy public schools, the same kind I went to you know, 50 or 60 years ago. And they get more out of that experience, in my view. They have a better balanced view of life going through that experience than you know, if I sent them off to some private school. I was with, actually, last week, uh, 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 there were six couples. Um, Bill and Melinda Gates arranged it, and, and they had the headmaster of a private school in Seattle that, that Bill went to. And it's a classy school. But, you know, if you're, I gather from the, in terms of the public school system, that you're making a conscious decision to hurt your kid if you don't send them to a private school, if you can afford one, you know. And that's why these people do it. And I don't blame them. I mean, I do the same thing. But the nice thing about it is that Omaha, and I'm sure Lincoln as well, and throughout Nebraska, we have kept a good public school system. And frankly, I think that's one of the most important things in America, because one of the things made, has made America what it is. Think, think about it. 1776, 3 million people in America, 300 million people in China, and 100 times as many people. They had the same IQs we had. You know, they had the same physical 
abilities and all that sort of thing. They had a culture that went far back. They had lots of natural resources. We didn't know about it then because we didn't have oil and they didn't have oil, but we both had oil in the end. Coal, all these things. You know, lot, educational institutions that far surpassed ours at the time. And now we end up, you know, 230 years later, we end up with, I don't know, 36 or 7 percent of the world's GDP. You know, from those three million people, something about the system really works. And I think one of the things that works about it is, is we come closer to equality of opportunity than any major country in the world. But the, one of the keys to having equal opportunity is a good public school system. You know, if you have one public school system for the rich and one for the poor, you do not have equality of opportunity. And, and I, so I, it, it's really one of the top things on my list. And when I got asked about, you know, what you can do with money, I think that. Anything that creates equality of opportunity right from the word go, I'm talking about from when you're five years old, and actually my daughter's working on something that goes back before that, but, but anything that creates equality of opportunity is what's going to keep you know, America what, well, you know, the kind of America that we, that we have now. It's, it's vital, and there's nothing more important than that than having a first-class public school system. And unfortunately, the communities where they've lost it don't get it back.